She's worked for three New York City mayors, but her new post may be the toughest of all, restoring trust in government as the new first deputy mayor. Maria Torres Springer is here, and The Point starts right now. Maria Torres Springer says she's taking over the job of the city's first deputy mayor at what she calls a complicated time. But the Yale and Harvard grad says she's up to the task. So you've said it's complicated. What's your first priority? My first priority is to make sure that we continue to be super focused on the work. So what does that mean for me, Marcia? It means that we continue to deliver quality services to New Yorkers, we keep advancing the major initiatives of this administration, and that we care for and support the people, the 300,000 public servants who wake up in the morning and work tirelessly to improve the lives of New Yorkers across the five boroughs. So you want them to know that business as usual continues and that they have to give their all? Um, this is exactly true, and you know what is, has been heartening and encouraging and humbling? is that they wake up in the morning already giving their all. And I've seen that. This has been my life's work. I've worked for the last three mayors and have had the wild fortune of standing shoulder to shoulder with public servants across many agencies. I've seen them give their all. They're committed to doing that now. And I view part of my job is to make sure that they have the support, the resources, and the motivation necessary to keep going. So do you think that you'll be reviewing um, hiring practices and people in different jobs and making recommendations to the mayor about that? Well, the mayor, when he, uh, my uh, appointment was announced, he also announced that we were going to do a full review, a review of programs, of processes, of personnel, to make sure that we as an administration maintain the strength that is needed to deliver for New Yorkers. So is this a top to bottom evaluation? I mean, are you looking at every agency? Are you looking at mayoral appointments? What, where are you going with this? Well, it will be comprehensive. Um, and of course, we have to make sure that we're triaging. So we'll make recommendations to the mayor that um, are timely and are the most urgent issues, again, to ensure that the 300 thousand public servants can continue to do their jobs, that New Yorkers see the fruits of that type of labor, and that we're not just trying to deliver basic services, we're actually trying to move the city forward. I mean, when we came into office, Marsha, you might remember, we were dealing with the economic devastation of right. COVID-19, yes, and there was an also has been um, a humanitarian migrant crisis, and we've had to deal with budget issues over the past couple of years. And so what we've accomplished in close to three years of regaining those jobs, recovering from the pandemic, making strides in childcare and public safety and housing, that can't miss a beat. And so I'm really focused on making sure we keep moving full steam ahead. So when you talk about the urgent needs that have to be done, what do you, what do you describe as the urgent needs, the urgent programs that you want to make sure continue? So let's talk about housing. Um, Your favorite topic. My, my favorite topic, and it's my favorite not just because the statistics, uh, Marsha, are so sobering with a 1.4% vacancy rate and 60,000 New Yorkers, mostly women and children, sleeping in shelters, right? It's, um, it's personal to me as well. I grew up with housing insecurity, so I know the feeling when you're not sure if you're going to make rent, when it matters if government... Um, understands those worries and tries to put you on a better path. And so whether it is the city of yes for housing opportunity or the um, historic uh, billions of dollars of resources for our housing agencies or the transformational work that we're doing at NYCHA, these are the types of actions that um, we have to take as an administration because there's too much at stake and too many families, too many New Yorkers who feel that type of insecurity on a day-to-day -day basis. Well, when you talk about housing, the one thing I have to ask you about is, is the Elizabeth Street Garden, the controversy of the people there just resisting the plans that you have to build housing for seniors there. And they, what they have been doing is they have been, they've gone to court 
to uh, get a court order to stop you. And they also have proposed two other locations where you could build property, arguing that green space is certainly as important as housing. So I wonder, like, is there a compromise here, or is it just we have to build on this specific spot? Well, we have to make sure that we're clear first, Marsha, about the facts. We started this project um, to build housing here almost a decade ago. What we're trying to do here is 123 units, fully affordable for low-income seniors. And a big percentage of the 123 are deeply affordable. And we're going to have um, green space as well as part of the project. You know, the mayor, I think, said it best. We're not disputing the beauty of the Elizabeth Street Garden. But we have to also think about the beauty that we create when we provide low-income seniors with the type of housing that they need. And so to delay this project, and we're on the cusp of breaking ground on it for more years of litigation, or to look at alternative sites that, again, would take years and years and years, I think betrays the many seniors who are looking for an affordable home. We have a waiting list for affordable senior housing. You know how big it is? It's about 200,000 people. Wow. So I, I have to answer to those 200,000 New Yorkers who say, we don't have to and we don't want to live this way. Please move forward with the type of project that can house us comfortably and affordably. And that's what we're trying to do here. But just in the last week, they've gotten yet another court order to stall it. I mean, how long is this going to go on before you could actually break ground? Well, we are going to keep up the advocacy um, and ensure that we keep fighting for New Yorkers. It, it's, it's in many ways, it has the notes of what we're trying to do with the City of Yes for Housing opportunity. I don't think anyone can deny that there's a housing crisis in this city, but it's not good enough to say we need more housing. Just don't do it in our neighborhood. We hear it all the time. Right? And NIMBYism in this city, unfortunately, Marsha, has a little bit of a bipartisan disposition. And if we keep, uh, if we relent on our efforts to build more housing, all that means is more displacement, rising rents, gentrification. The mayor has been clear from day one that we have to have the political courage as well as the type of incredible technical work that's happening across the agencies to make a dent on this housing crisis. It's really one of our top priorities and we're not going to stop until we move that needle. You know, talking about rising rents, there was a study that came out on Friday that said that New York had the largest increase in housing and incidental housing costs of any state in the entire nation. And it said that in the last four years, it's gone up, now hold your breath, over $16,000 mm. per household. Mm -hmm. So how do you deal with that? At the same time, you're trying to build affordable housing, given the fact that the cost of housing is skyrocketing in the entire city. That, that's right. Well, we have to get at the root of the problem. The root of the problem is we don't have enough supply. The fact is we've added hundreds of thousands of people, hundreds of thousands of jobs in our city, but we haven't built enough housing. It's simply the laws of supply and demand. And so through City of Yes for Housing Opportunity, building a little bit more housing in every neighborhood not huge dramatic change to any particular neighborhood, but collectively has us moving the city in the right direction, really key. Then we have to keep up our efforts. We have back-to-back -back records in terms of financing affordable housing, and we have to make the type of change to a huge um, source of our affordable housing, which is NYCHA. So it's going to take all of that and continuing to work with our partners at the state level and at the federal level, it's not just a New York problem. It's not just a blue state problem. The housing crisis, it's national, it's deep, it's been unrelenting. But we want to make sure in this administration that we're not accepting that as the only way we can live because we know there are choices we can make to change the equation. Deputy Mayor, first Deputy Mayor Maria Torres Springer, thank you so much for joining me. We're going to have to leave it right there for now, but our conversation continues right after the show on our streaming channel, CBS News, New York.
I'm joined now by political consultant O'Brien Murray and Larry Levy, executive dean of the National Center for Suburban Studies at Hofstra University. So guys, Governor Hochul is involved in the fight of her life to try to help the Democrats flip control of the House from Republican to Democrat. How's she doing? I think you've got the great uh, answers on Long Island. You've got I, New York 1 and New York uh, yeah, 4, really. I, 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 mean, I think e even if you love Kathy Hochul, y you'd have to concede that in 2022, uh, her performance at the top of the ticket, which was one of the weakest that a Democratic gubernatorial candidate has had in the state, was in part responsible for Republicans doing as well as they did Nancy in flipping Pelosi districts. Nancy Pelosi blamed her twice. Yeah. So, uh, she lost Long Island. She lost Both Long counties. Island. Well, in Zeldin, having a Zeldin on course, the ticket contributed of course, to that. But, but uh, so Hochul uh, is putting everything she has into it in terms of uh, uh, whatever funds she can help direct that way, manpower, uh, person power. But the thing you have difference too, don't forget, is you have the Democratic Party in New York and you have the opportunity for the Speaker of the House to be from Brooklyn. So Hakeem Jeffries and Jay Jacobs working very well together. Jay is a Nassau right. County chairman, but also statewide. So, means a lot for New Yorkers and the Democratic Party and her future. But guys, there are five seats that they want to flip. <laughs> if you were betting men, how many of those seats do you think they will actually be able to flip? Go ahead, Obi. I think answer. only a couple at this point right now. I think New York, New York 4 is the one right now. Despacito, I think, is tougher. In upstate, you've got one. But I don't think the other ones are, are within reach at this point. How do you feel about well, that? Well, I'm not a betting man. Uh, and I think that the races are about where everybody expected, which is pretty darn close. Uh, the, the fourth district that, that just mentioned um, is definitely a nail biter. That's um, Anthony D D Esposito Gillen and, Esposito. and, and Laura Gillen. Uh, uh, Avalon out in the first district against Lolota, uh, when uh, Harris ascended to the top of the ticket, probably moved Avalon, the Democrat, from slim to none to maybe because he's raising mm -hmm. a lot of money and and he's created a little bit of a buzz because of his media experience. Uh, Swazi pretty much sent the message in the special election in February that he's in pretty strong shape for a variety of reasons. And Garbarino has a district that was made even more Republican during a gerrymander that really didn't help Democrats very much. But, you know, but, Hakeem Jeffries but, actually told me that he thought he had a chance with Garbarino in flipping it because he thinks it's a little bit purple, no? I think it's much more Desposito is the issue than, than Garbarino. Uh, yeah, it, 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 if, if Garbarino loses that district... Uh, Kamala Harris will be president of the United States, yeah. and the Democrats will control both ca houses I, of Congress because it'll mean there's some w giant wave out there that nobody's seeing. Avalon, so, I think, would, could be the could be the surprise out there, though. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't, as you said, and I've said on the air before, with Harris at the top of the ticket, helped her, helped him much better than Biden. But right now, at this point, Avalon can fire on all cylinders. He's raising money. He's in known quantity now on, by CNN. He's getting known by the independent voters, and he can swing, swing Republicans. He can do it more out there than, than anybody else can. How about the two other upstate um, seats in our district, Mike Lawler and Mark Molinaro? Lawler's fine, and I'm, I've been on air here before saying I wish he wasn't, but but he'll be fine, and so is uh, I think I think Marcus will be fine too. Yeah, I think that's what the polls seem to indicate. That's what the prognosticators hmm. say. People who are in the weeds on the streets up there, but those races could go either direction. It really depends. Hmm more than any particular issue or personality on how the top of the ticket performs. The difference between Lawler, though, is when you're talking about the suburban districts out here, you've got his opponent that lost the working families line, which makes a big difference now in that Democratic side of the House. But it's still a one-point race, but, according to the recent polls. But that's, that's some of the polling, and it will be, but, but that district is one that the Democrats should be able to win under other circumstances. But I think they got the wrong candidate. They have a candidate that's too far left that ran for Congress in Brooklyn when he got chased out of there. Now. Here's what it really comes down to. It doesn't matter what the personalities, the particular local issues, the amount of money being spent here and there. If Donald Trump does better in these congressional districts than he did in 2020, the Republicans are going to win him. And in fact, they'll probably win other districts around the country that are very similar to these swing suburban places. If Kamala Harris does better than Joe Biden, Democrats are going to win these seats. So let me ask you this. Do you think that the governor's efforts to flip the House and working really hard, she's opened 65 different offices around the state, are hurt by the fact that her popularity numbers are so very low? She's in the 30s. Well, clearly there's a yin and the yang going on here. Take, I mean, take Donald Trump. He definitely assures that the 
conservative MAGA faithful come out in droves that you don't see uh, in, in, in our metro area. At the same token, he tends to turn off people who have voted Republican. So the question is, which yin is stronger than the yang? The other thing, don't forget, she's raising money. She's putting the organization together. Where, where she is the face of the party is where that becomes a question of whether it's about her or not. But here's what, the but, other question, Obi. If, in fact, she doesn't, she, they don't flip these seats, she's going to be blamed. She's going to get blamed, but also she's going to get credit. And as she said yesterday, there's rumors about her going to a Harris administration. Remember, she was a big supporter of President Biden. She was one of the last ones to... to quiet down about that. Her own lieutenant governor was asking President Biden to get out before she did and went against her. And and the real question becomes, what is going to happen after the election? And it's not just the win, it's the spin. What did she do versus what did what could she have done? And don't forget, Hochul's efforts are mostly behind the scenes. I mean, we know about it because we talk to people. Yeah, we she's read, she's tea the leaves. one who's spending all the money. She's the one that's that's got the Democrats spending money in 65 different offices. But if she's on TV in Long Island, it's not for the Democrats. Oh, but wait a second. Right. Wait a second. That's, exactly, that's my next question. Oh, Democrats, so Republicans, Republicans are, are clearly campaigning against her. Republicans have her and Eric Adams in campaign commercials from one end of the state Absolutely. to the other saying that they were contributing to a rise in crime and God knows how many other things. And this week at Al Smith, smart? Donald Trump was talking positive about Hochul and about Adams. <laughs> and, 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 and Democrat, just like Republicans are putting starring Hochul and Adams in ads against uh, Laura Gillen and other Democrats. It's all around the state. They're but using but Democrats the are doing the same thing with Donald Trump. So the question is, which one of them is going to have, relatively speaking, the most negative or positive the, impact? The biggest difference, I would say, is this. The mayor of New York City, historically, has always been an enemy of Long Islanders right. because of the tax money they want to spend here, because the education money, everything else. That's number one. Number two, the uniqueness here is Governor Cuomo never had an issue in Long Island in either county. And the numbers there are significant. So that's the real difference here, because you would not have seen a Cuomo ad against uh, using the governor against fellow Democrats. So I have to ask you this question. So the governor, to try to help people, uh, the uh, Democrats take their seats, paused congestion pricing, allegedly till after the election, but who knows. So what happens after the election? Does she go to unpaused congestion pricing, or does she try to find some other way to fund the MTA that involves state money, federal money, something. I, I suspect if she is, it depends on how successful the Democrats are in this election. That's kind of a, a bellwether that'll give her an indication of whether she can has to follow the school of smaller steps or can go big. If uh, the Democrats don't do well, she is not going to dare try to do anything that's particularly unpopular, particularly in the swing suburbs. I mean, don't forget, pausing can get congestion pricing, whatever you think of it, played well, certainly in the 4th District, uh, Gillen versus she, Esposito. But she also has, after this race, after this election, she has an issue of Eric Adams and what happens in the mayor's race in New York City. And what does congestion pricing mean to Brooklyn, to right. Queens, right. to Staten Island, and the Bronx? What is going to happen there? And also, what so happens to her two years later? So you're predicting yes to congestion pricing? I'm predicting she will sit on her hands as long as she can to make sure it's not an issue for Eric Adams or for herself. Right. Yeah. And, they're gonna read, and they're going to read polls, too. If it turns out in a, in a year or so, even if the Democrats win a bunch of these seats, that it plays really badly, and she wants to run for re-election, she's going to go very slowly and look for those alternatives. She'll let the courts... There are a number of alternatives. She'll let the, but she'll let the courts and the lawyers take sure. care of it, too. That's part of it, too. So we're going to have to leave it right there for now, but we'll be right back. Thank you for joining me. Is it okay to tell a little white lie, to exaggerate just a tad on a job application or when telling a story? New Yorkers are weighing in on your point. Have you ever embellished your resume or an application for anything? No, I have not. Uh, not really. No, no, I haven't. I'm um, very honest, Woka. No. You would never do that? I would never do that. So, Because <laughs> um, you have to speak to it at the interviews. I was a principal of a high school, so you don't cheat. Have you ever embellished your resume or on an application? No, actually no. How come? 
because it's good enough. Those things always come back to haunt people. I haven't submitted a resume for an application for a job. I didn't need to. Ah, good answer. I don't think I have to. Uh, maybe not. A little white lie? Okay, yes. Okay, yes. A little white lie. You confess to a little white lie. I have embellished in the fact that if they were to ask me about it, it is true, but not like very true. Do you know anyone who exaggerates when telling a story? Of course, everyone. Um, my mom. Oh, everyone I know. <laughs> They're great storytellers, so they exaggerate a little so bit. So to be a great storyteller, you have to exaggerate. A little bit. Not lie, but exaggerate. Oh, yes. I do presume that lots of colleagues of mine do embellish their uh, resumes. Plenty of people. And why do they do that? For attention, I suppose, better ratings. Because it's bigger than life. Okay. And we all enjoy drama. For the effects, for the story, for the plot line, for the funny. It makes for a story. A better story. Of course. And it's okay if it's a better story. It's a story. When moms embellish stories about their childhoods, they'll be like, back oh, in my day, I had to walk through jungles and mountains, and I had to, like, you know, like, our parents didn't love us. Loving your kid was invented to the 90s. Is it a big deal to stretch the truth? In certain circumstances, it is. Okay. I think it's a big deal. I think you should be honest. I think so, personally. It really depends on the, on the, on the, on the context. It depends on the context of who you're speaking to. To lie, to flat out lie, say, I served in the military and you didn't, that's a lie. That's not, you know, stretching the truth. You should never stretch the truth. I mean, unless you're sitting in a bar with a bunch of friends and you want to make the story a little more interesting. A comedian on stage who embellishes a story to make people laugh, it's fine to do that. A politician running for office, it's not.